Let's go to the Lord. Father, we have a ministry. Many of us are choosing to enter into a new ministry in a new place. I pray that you give us wisdom and insight about how to go about it and what the mission is. Why, why would we do such a thing? So give us an understanding of it and prepare us to do it. In Christ's name, amen. All right, let me read you this introduction. Almost daily, we watch the news and see the desperate condition that our government, which is deeply divided, they've abandoned honor integrity, just amazing what you see, amazing what people are willing to do to try to gain power or hold power. We live out the hot politics of hate and blame and bitterness, and it's become so entrenched that we can't even talk about it anymore. The two sides of, of all of this can't even discuss. And we think this is a big deal. We're very tuned into this, and, and, and as we should be to some degree, and I hope you get out and vote uh, your conscience. But listen, these governmental issues, they're just symptoms. They're not the problem. They're symptoms. They're, they're symptoms of much deeper issues. The real and deeper problem is in the spiritual area, in the spiritual realm, and what you find is that the church, the pulpits of America, have done a very poor job, very poor. And we're going to discuss that today. Uh, the ignorance of the individual believer and therefore the failure of the church. As goes the individual, go so, so goes the church. The church has decided to entertain and distract rather than educate and inspire. America's pulpits have fulfilled the itching ears prophecy. You know, you know that prophecy? that the church will gather around themselves teachers to scratch their itching ears, to give them what they want rather than what they need. We've, we've fulfilled this prophecy of 2 Timothy 4, 3, and 4. Now, we're going to look at what the church has offered the average believer out there today, and we're going to talk about what I see is my part, at least, in this mission to offer a consistent, coherent Christian message. This is the better hope. What the people are being taught from the pulpit in America is terrible. Terrible. It's, it's given them nothing, no clarity, no understanding, nothing but emotion. We are to give them a better hope. And listen, this church has a message that is a better hope. Now, we're not better than anybody else, but we've done a better job of studying the Bible coherently, giving a clear gospel to be saved, a clear doctrine to live by. This is what we have to bring. This will bring clarity to the lives of baby believers and those we're talking about moody and extending out to the whole world. So, Let's talk about, in this first section, about how God has revealed himself. First of all, the principle of progressive revelation. If you study the Bible from the beginning down to the end, what you discover is that God began with very, gave, gave man very little information. In the garden, he only gave him enough information that we know of to say yes or no to the tree. There's only one way to sin, one way to fail, and that was by eating the tree. Now, the devil, you know, what's interesting is when you discuss theology with people, and I've been hashing some stuff out with Calvinists, you know, you got to ask them, how do y'all fit the devil into your theology and they can't? They're like, we don't really know why he's in the garden from the beginning of human history, why he's, what's his interest? What's his, what's his agenda? Why is he trying to deceive men, uh, 
Adam and Eve. What's his purpose? Well, I tell you what it is. It's because at this point, the Lucifer and the fallen angels have been judged and sentenced to the lake of fire, and they're, they're very busy trying to avoid going to the lake of fire. That's their main thing. They don't want to go to the lake of fire. And so God, in managing this angelic war, which has been likened to a court case, where there is the prosecution and the defense. You know, you study the book of Job and you see the, you see the devil's argument, which is, you know, the first argument is, uh, you know, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil says, well, sure, you've given him everything. You know, you've protected him uh, like you did me in the beginning, but take everything away from him like you did me, and he's going to get mad and curse you. That's the devil's argument. The second one was, uh, you know, threaten his life, threaten his health like you've done with me, and he will curse you. See, the devil said, forget you, God. So the devil is making this argument. And so God, the reason God has this progressive, slow evolving of the revelation is so that he doesn't get ahead of himself and the devil doesn't know what's next. He doesn't know what's next. Now, he knows what's at the very end, but he doesn't know what's next. Now, you start out in the Garden of Eden, and, and you guys know this, with Genesis 3.15 as the first gospel. You see that Adam and Eve fail. They fall. They're spiritually dead, and they're in trouble. And God comes along and promises them salvation through the seed of the woman. You heard that term before, the seed of the woman? You know, he says to the woman, uh, your seed will defeat his seed, meaning the devil's seed. And so we see the seed of the woman all the way through the Bible. We, uh, we, now, we're gonna ha now that the seed of the woman prophecy has been given, this promise, we're going to have to ask, who is it? Who's going to be the seed of the woman? Well, Cain kills Abel, who was uh, going to be the lion, but... So Abel's dead. Now Seth is elevated to this line. He's now the line of the Messiah. Seth gives birth ultimately to Noah. Noah gives birth ultimately to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 tribes. And here you have now 12 tribes with several million people and you still don't know who the Messiah is going to be. See, if the devil knew who the line of Messiah was going to be, he'd be after him. So it's not until Abraham comes along, actually until Jacob is on his deathbed, that he prophesies which of these 12 tribes Messiah will come from. Now, what I want you to see is God is slowly opening things up. It's like one of those... Uh, you know, it's like one of those presents where, you know, you open the big box and then there's another box. And you know, that, you know and now you're down to the... So it's every, every step of the way God opens something else. It's like this thing keeps folding out, folding out. One time somebody gave me this big, huge history. It's like a history of the whole Bible. And it was, you know, once you folded it all the way out, it stretched along the whole wall. But it just kept on going. You thought, all right, this is the end. No, it kept on going again. So this is called progressive revelation, where God slowly but surely unfolds and gives you more information. So with Jacob, we still don't know who Messiah is going to be, where he's going to come from. And he, then, then Jacob says, all right, he's going to come from Judah. Now the tribe of Judah is going to have Messiah. And so tribe of Judah rocks along through history for a while, and then the next thing you know, we've got David. Then God says he's going to be the son of David. 
and then you end up with uh, Solomon on one side and Nathan on the other. Solomon becomes the line of Mary. Nathan becomes the line of Joseph. And out of that comes Jesus. See, you don't know from the beginning the seed of the woman up until the birth of Christ, you don't know who Messiah is going to be. But when he's born and God announces it, wow, you've got all this activity. you got all this demon activity. In the first century Israel, demons were everywhere. They were all over the place, you know. And they weren't, they weren't in elementary school either, little demons. Uh, but the point is the plan unfolds a piece at a time, and if you don't understand what God is doing in the Bible, if you don't understand that what's happening in Genesis is the foundation for everything, but what's, what's taught in Genesis does not apply to where we are now, if you don't understand that Moses is going to bring the law, which has a great purpose, but it doesn't apply to us now, then you're going to mix it all up, which is what's going on today. So the plan unfolds a piece at a time, and we've got to rightly divide it. So this passage in 2 Timothy, I know you've heard it, uh, it, you know, the uh, King James says, study to show yourself approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This word rightly dividing, ortho tomeo, means to cut straight. means to cut something along a straight line. And literally, it referred to the stonemasons who would take a big block huge block, and out of it, they would cut a stone, and they would fit it in with other stones, for instance, in a wall, and that stone would be cut just perfectly to fit with this other stone. If there was a hump, there'd be a hump, but everything was cut just right. And listen, these things stayed together for th a thousand years or more without even any mortar. They were so tightly cut together. This is what he's talking about, but he's talking about doing it with the word. We're to separate concepts from the whole Bible and then put them back together to form a belief system. This is rightly dividing. What we do, we're going to study the doctrine of hope today. I'm going to pull the, the concept of hope out from the Bible. We're going to discuss different aspects of it. Then we're going to stick it right back in to the whole system so that you can have a belief and understand how hope fits with faith, fits with your future, you got to put it back together. So you pull it apart and put it back together. That's categorical teaching. That's what we do here. Now, the third idea that I want to talk about now is uh, dispensations. You all know what dispensations is? Yeah, I know that some of you do. Uh, dispensations, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Let me show you dispensations. You see, these things are so important to be able to understand the Bible. Y'all getting hot? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know some of us are, uh, so you need a like a fire hose. You me to wet you down. Uh, in Ephesians chapter three, uh, verses one through ten, Paul's going to talk about his ministry. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, for the sake of the Gentiles, since in, since you have heard of my stewardship, and that word stewardship, oikonomia, means dispensation. It means to means a, manage, a management of assets. Now, let's say you had, you had some money and you, and you put it in, in the hands of a money manager of some kind. That money manager would be an oikonomia. He's a manager of money. He's a manager of assets. 
the assets Paul is talking about are the assets of, the, of living the Christian life. His job was to communicate the new principles that apply to living in the church age. You see, for 2,000 years or more, they had been living under the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law came to an end. Last Sunday, Ron talked in depth about the Mosaic Law is done. Don't live under the law anymore. So we're not under law. But if you go to many of the churches, they're going to give you law. They're going to take something from the Old Testament, from the words of Jesus, and they're going to pile it all together and mash it up and present it to you as if it was a rule to live by today. This is what's happening out there, folks. So he says that by way of revelation there was made known to me the mystery. This always, when you see the word mystery in the New Testament, it always has to do with the church age doctrines, as I wrote before. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my, uh, my insight into the mystery of Christ which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has been made known now to the holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. In other words, the church age doctrines were not revealed to the Old Testament believers. Okay? None of this was taught. None of it was taught in the Old Testament. The way that we live now Nobody in the Old Testament could have anticipated that. Nobody had an inkling that the Holy Spirit would come to live inside our bodies. Listen, when the Jews heard that, they just their heads started spinning off. They couldn't believe that the human body would be the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God, that we would actually be able to be given the thoughts of Jesus Christ, that we, listen, the things that he believed that, that enabled him to live out his life in purity, these very beliefs and thoughts have been given to us for us to take and use as our own. You follow that? His very thoughts, his beliefs, his ideas are ours to use. Now, we learn them and we put them in our soul and we find tremendous resistance within ourselves because of our old beliefs that fight back and forth and we have to get rid of these a piece at a time to really embrace the, the new beliefs. But that's part of transformation. This is what Paul's trying to introduce you to. He said it was, nobody, was, nobody was given this in the Old Testament. Listen, they lived by rules. I will tell you this, the Spirit was available in the Old Testament time. All they had to do was ask. There were believers who were given the Spirit who saw through the law and the rituals to see the essence of the message, like Simeon, who was on the steps of the temple when Jesus was, what, five days old? And listen, he prophesied to Mary what was going to happen. He understood what was happening. Listen, here's the point I'm trying to make, that even in the Old Testament, they had the Spirit, and they could see and get, and get insight. But what they didn't have was the thoughts of Jesus Christ, called the mind of Christ. Now, he says, these were not made known in, in ages past, specifically that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. In other words, the Jews thought they were the only ones. The nation Israel, they had no idea that Gentiles would be grafted in, that we Gentiles, or y'all, I got 12% Jewish blood, who knows if it's real or not? Who knows? But I like to say I'm blood related to Jesus. I got I, I inherited all the best parts. Uh, 
He says specifically that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members, fellow partakers of the promise through the gospel. He said, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, given to me according to the working of his power, to me the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ to bring to light what is the administration, there's our word dispensations again, the administration of the mystery for age, for ages having been hidden in God. And he says he's done, that God has done all this. He has held back this information about the church age so that, uh, verse 10, that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Those are fallen angels. This was in accordance with his eternal purpose. Now, dispensations is the study of the different periods of time and the different systems that God used to reveal himself during that time. Initially, during the, from the fall to Moses, it's called the age of the Gentiles, or really Abraham. And God literally spoke directly to people. He appeared to them and spoke to them. That was interesting. From the Mosaic, from, from Moses until Christ, it's called the age of the Jews. God gave rules. He gave laws, not just to be followed, but he gave also promises. See, you got the, the law and the promises. The law is what showed you you're a sinner and you need a Savior. You couldn't keep it. It was too detailed. It was too difficult. Your nature went against it. You couldn't do it. And it showed you, I've got to have a Savior. But then the promises, the rituals came along, and the animal sacrifices, these, these were the, this was the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world that was practiced all through the age of Israel. The promises are what got you saved. You can get saved by keeping the law. You got saved by the promises, believing that Christ would come and pay for your sins. Now, see, little at a time, God's opening this thing up. Little at a time, he's showing us how this works, what he's got in store for us. Dispensations, recognizing the different ways that God reveals himself and his plan within the context of the angelic conflict. Each period of history as divided by God corresponds to some aspect of the angelic conflict. This is verse 10 where he's showing the great wisdom of God to the angels. I remember sitting in a Bible study early on. I'd only been saved maybe a year. And uh, I was sitting in a Bible study in Huntsville, and I'd been reading my Bible like crazy. Right after I got saved, I went to see an old friend who was, had got saved earlier. And he said, read the book of John. So I did, and it was like, wow, that's crazy. You know, I would just had this Holy Spirit. I was, I was so hungry. Man, I was reading and reading and reading. And I started reading the Gospels, and it was like I read things that were like, I don't know how this works. So I'm sitting in a Bible study, and Buddy Peak explains dispensations. And he said, Jesus speaking in the Gospels is talking to Jews in the Old Testament. And a light bulb went ding. Holy, no wonder I can't make those fit. No wonder you read the Sermon on the Mount and you're like, the meek shall inherit the earth, all this. And I'm like, how do you do that? How? And, and, and so anyway, it showed me that it's Paul who really explains the New Testament way of life, that what Jesus was teaching was to Jews under the Old Covenant, and that all of that's of importance. It all sets up the New Testament, but you don't live under the words of Jesus. You don't live under that. Many people try to live under that. Many people. So, dispensations enables a believer to separate the Scriptures out into the age in which you live. 
I've got somebody that I love dearly who goes to the Methodist church, and they're not quite sure what they believe. If you ask them, what do you believe about so-and-so, they're like, mm, what's that? It's like I was in a Bible study not long ago. I told you that I, t- I referred to fallen angels, and two of the people in it looked at me and went, what are fallen angels? <laughs> it was like, wow. They're not, people aren't being taught anything. Now, I'm not saying every church, you know, but I'm saying a majority of them. The majority of churches that you go to, there's nothing being taught, nothing. The, the principles of the New Testament, the spirit-filled life, walking in the spirit, the faith cycle, the faith, faith rest life, this, this isn't being taught. This isn't being taught at all. So, when you understand dispensations and progressive revelation and the way God has laid this out, it allows a believer to follow only what pertains to the age in which they live. It allows us to see the church age under which we live and use and, listen, separate those principles out and teach them and use them. I'm going to sit if you guys don't mind, even if you do mind. It's better than falling down. Uh, Without the clarity that comes from understanding progressive revelation and dispensations, it's inevitable that American pulpits will produce a mashed up version of often, and I just picked these out, often made up of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law, or parts of it, maybe the dietary laws. People try to take the dietary laws and say, well, these are really healthy for you. The reason God gave them is they're really healthy. Okay, I'm not going to fight you over that. They have nothing to do with the spiritual life. Neither do the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments have nothing to do with the spiritual life. They mash up the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law, the words in red, the words of Jesus. They'll borrow some Old Testament rituals. And then the New Testament ideas, They listen, they mash all of this up together. One week you might get a discussion of the, of the Ten Commandments. The next week you might have a discussion on tithing. See, what is tithing? Old Testament income tax. But it's taught as New Testament giving, right? All over the place. When you teach people tithing and you tell them they are responsible, indebted to give God a certain portion of their income, it robs them of the freedom to give. You can't give to somebody that's expecting something in the first place. Whatever you give them, that's their due. It's like a payment. See? And so you go places and they say, no, you owe God. You, gotta owe, you owe God 10% of your money. Well, is that from the gross or the net? How, you can imagine how many fights are over that. It's like, who cares? <clears throat> and listen. You think that's a lot? 10%? That's not a lot. I promise you, when when your life's over and you're on your deathbed and you've got a bunch of stuff piled up over here that you didn't use or you didn't give away, that didn't get used in the Lord's and you've just got it piled up, you're going to say, hmm, what is all that for? Why did God give me that? What was its purpose? Just for me to feel secure? It's all piled up? Not my idea. Now, here's what I'm... When people do that, when they mix the Bible all up and they, you know, you get some ground-up beef with some bone and some broccoli... 
<laughs> There's a thing on Facebook I saw the other day. It was about all these little kids. They give them broccoli, and they're like, no. It's just natural to dislike broccoli. You know, broccoli. Broccoli is bad. Uh, did y'all know that? That's a biblical principle. Broccoli is bad. Uh, when, you, when you mix the scriptures all up and feed it to believers as a way of life, it's poison. It's spiritual poison. You poison their soul. We have the antidote to this poison. We can bring healing to the heart of the believer by being faithful to teach biblical principles from a dispensational framework. It's got to be done that way. We call it ICE, but dispensations, understanding that the words of Jesus have their place, they have their purpose, but they don't apply to the church age. There are always going to be principles that apply all the way through. For instance, the concepts about marriage and family. Wherever you go in the Bible, you're going to find a consistency about marriage and family. They're always the same. Those principles apply. But the spiritual principles of walking with God in the church age, it's very different than in the old covenant. So here's the point that I'm trying to make in this first, first section of study is that we're in a situation in America where the people, the believers, the church has not, they've not been taught properly. They've not been given basic solutions to life. Basic solutions to life. I mean, you go to church and you're not taught any clarity, any understanding of how to deal with issues, how to deal with your marriage, with your kids. You know, what What drives me crazy is the, I turn on the TV and listen to some of these guys, and it's like, you know, what if what if somebody goes in there that their marriage is on the rocks, and they think, all right, I'm going to turn to God, and, and by turning to God, hopefully God will help save my marriage. And they go in there, and they hear, something on the Ten Commandments. How does that help? They don't hear grace. They don't hear faith. They don't hear the Holy Spirit. They don't hear these things that all apply to the Christian life, walking in the Spirit. Listen, walking in the Spirit resolves a bunch of problems. All right. So, this is where we get the idea of a better hope. There's a better hope. There's a better way. We know that. Do you agree with that? Do you not think that we've been taught in a way that gives us a clarity about the, the scriptures that will enable any believer to live? I mean, I, I know how to solve my problems. I know how to, to not have the problems. Don't have kids. I'm just teasing. Not really, but I'm just teasing. Uh, all right, let's talk about hope. We'll talk about hope, and then we'll take a break. First of all, the word hope is the Greek word elpis. And elpis doesn't mean I hope so, as in maybe this will happen and maybe it won't. The word elpis means to be confident. It's really the word expectation. I, I liken it to somebody said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come pick you up at the house at 7 o'clock. And so about 5 till 7, you start looking out the window. Maybe you've got the front door open with the screen door closed, and you're, you're looking for them. So about every two or three minutes, you walk by, and you check to see if they pulled up, right? That's an expectation. You're waiting on them. You're expecting them to arrive to get you. That's the word help us. It's not, oh, I hope this, I hope they show up. Oh, I hope they do. No, it's like I'm I'm expecting them. Somebody calls and says, hey, you want to go? No, I mean I've got somebody coming over. You know, I'm expecting them any minute now. And that is the word. It means to have confident expectation. Uh, it's often translated to wait expectantly. 
And it means to have confidence in your future. Your future. Listen, the future, there's two things that are really, really important. In fact, all of it's important. Right now and your future. If you're still damaged by your past, those are things that God has enabled us to resolve, that need to be resolved. I would encourage you to do so. You say, I don't know how. I can, I'll be glad to help you to resolve things from your past. It's a, it's, a, it's a technique. It's a way of thinking about things that God has enabled us to do that I'd be glad to show you. Uh, I don't charge very much. Uh, in fact, I don't charge at all. But the point is now, this very second, listen, the, the, the Spirit is speaking to you now, in the moment. He's not speaking to you a moment from now. He's speaking to you right now. If you're not in the moment, if you're not here right now, within yourself, conscious and aware of what's going on, you're going to miss the Spirit. A lot of people don't, they say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't hear the Spirit. I don't communicate with God. He doesn't speak to me. That's like because you live in the past. You live in the future. You can't hear him in the past or in the future. You can only hear him right now. That's real important. So, hope or confidence is the natural result of faith. You can see this in Romans 15, 13. We'll go look at it. Here's the point. Whatever we believe to be true or real is what we expect to happen. The Bible has promised us that Christ is going to return. So, if you believe that's true, you're expecting that. He could come any day, any moment. Any moment, and we're to be expectantly waiting, anticipating his return. That's the word elpis. That means that's the idea, biblical idea of hope. You're confidently, expectantly waiting on something. So, whatever you believe is what you expect. Does that make sense? Whatever you believe to be true. For instance, if you believe that your partner is going to be faithful to you, then you just expect that. You expect that. And so you, you've been married 20 years, and that's always been the case. you got good evidence to expect that. You're not dumb to expect that. That's the character of the person that you're with. You know? And so it's common sense to expect that. doesn't mean that nothing, no, something could happen. Bad things could happen, but... Your future, based on the past, on the history, is smart to be confident about that, all right, because of what you believe. So, you know, <laughs> Alabama's got a pretty good football team this year, I'd have to say. I mean, Auburn does too, but... But Alabama's just got, they're like crazy good. I mean, it's just insane good. So when they line up, you just expect them to win. I mean, everybody's expecting them to win all the way through. So, and I live with a really, really big Alabama fan. Uh, I mean, I, I like Alabama. I like Auburn, too. I mean, I like both of them. But, uh, you know, my daughters are really big Alabama fans, and maybe one other person in my life is a big Alabama fan. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is this: this is what you expect. It's what you expect. So, whatever you believe to be true is what you expect to happen. Faith and hope are like two sides of the same coin. Whatever your faith is in, is what your expectations are attached to. Now listen, here's what's important. And I'll get to this in a second, but our faith, our hope, our love, our fear is always attached to an object. 
somebody comes to me and says, I, I'm afraid, I, fear, I, I feel fearful all the time. I'm like, what are you, what's the question? What are you afraid of? What have you attached your fear to? Right? See, fear is something that's possible at any given moment. You have fear and you attach it to an object, literally an image in your mind, an image. So, faith and hope are, are, are even synonymous sometimes. But secondly, hope is always attached to the future. There's no such thing as hoping for what you already have. Uh, go to Romans chapter 8 right quick, and we'll see this, and, and we'll take a break here just shortly. Romans 8. Uh, starting with verse 19, Romans 8, 19. He says, the anxious creation, uh, the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hoping, the creation is hoping that it will be set free from its slavery. And this is talking about the curses. The creation, and listen, this is, the creation is not got a mind. This is an analogy, all right? The creation wants to be set free from the slavery of the curses. For we know the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth uh, together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, uh, yeah, going down to verse 24. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen or, or possessed is not hope at all. For why would you hope for what you already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, i.e. our future, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. So hope, listen, hope is what we would call a problem-solving device. Hope is the, is the antidote to depression, to discouragement. Hope. If you understand hope and you understand how to use it in your life, it, it's an antidote to many problems. Before we quit, let's let's uh, uh, look at Ephesians chapter one. Just turn over there right quick, and then we'll take a break. I'll read this to you. I'm going to show you how hope works. Ephesians one, verse eighteen. One of my favorite verses. He says in verse 8, this is Paul's prayer. He starts it back in verse 16. And he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, and I love that phrase, the eyes of your heart. Of course, we understand that that's an image he's given us, and it has to do, the image communicates the ability to visualize your heart does not have eyes, literally. But your heart, your spiritual heart, does have the ability to see, to visualize. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened or literally given light. So that you may know, the word oida means to be able to see with your mind, so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, uh, of his inheritance, and the power that is in us. So we're going to look, come back and look at how hope is attached to an image in your mind. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our church. We thank you for the members that are off learning and growing and trying to understand the mission, where are we headed from here. You've given us so much over 40 years, Father, and now it's time to give it back in service. And so we 
we just pray that you prepare us for that and help us to understand where we're headed and that the offering that's given today that will be used and multiplied many times in Christ's name. Amen. Now, well, let's talk about hope. Let's get down to how does it work. We talked about what it is. It's confidence in the future. As you look at your future, you're, the, the idea of hope is that I'm confident that this is going to happen. You know, pick out something that you're most confident about. The sun is going to rise tomorrow. And, I mean, do you think the sun's going to come up tomorrow? You do? Right? Yeah. I mean, not exactly. It doesn't exactly come up, but, you know. But anyway, you know it's going to, the earth's going to rotate and the sun's going to appear in the sky, whether it's covered up with clouds or not, but it's going to be there. So that's called confidence. Now, what else in your life have you attached that to, that kind of certainty? See, see hope in our biblical sense, is that sense of certainty about something in the future. What are you certain about? You know, we're often, we attach confidence or certainty to things in life that aren't really certain. Like we get a bunch of money in the bank, got a retirement program, we got all this money in a fund or something, we think, oh boy, I'm set for life now. I'm ready, good to go. Maybe, maybe not. That's not something to, to attach certainty to. What you can attach certainty to, though, is the promise of God that says, I will meet your needs no matter what. That you can be certain about. That you can be certain about. So, anyway, let's look. Let's go back and look at this. Uh, we're under, under the first principle of definition, description, and let's go to C, Let faith and hope must have an object. Kind of got ahead of myself a little bit. Faith and hope. Uh, in John 5, 45, Jesus said to the Jews who was, he was dealing with that they had put their hope or confidence in Moses, meaning they were trusting the Mosaic law to save them. Acts 23, 6 talks about putting your hope in the resurrection, meaning that because Jesus resurrected from the dead, we also will have a resurrection from the dead. He defeated death, and we can look forward in our mind and be confident that when we die, when I die, death will not be an enemy. Death will be a door. It will be a door into the greatest blessing that I've ever experienced. So don't ask me back. Uh, now, you can read these on the promise of God in Acts 26. He talks about in Galatians 5, 5, the hope of righteousness. What that means is that at the point of salvation, we were imputed the righteousness of God. We're, we're, we're put into Christ, become part of his body, we're connected to him, and we share his righteousness. It's given to us. Excuse me, we don't deserve it, we don't earn it, it's given. So the fact that it's given to us gives us confidence in our future that when we come before God, We'll be righteous. We'll have a righteous standing before him, and God can only bless those that are righteous. He, only, he, only, he can't curse. You can't, it's impossible to go to the lake of fire if you're righteous. So the hope of righteousness that he's talking about in Galatians is the fact that it's this, it's this image in your mind that when you stand before God, you're good to go. So... What you need to understand, what's important, and this may, this may, uh, but anyway, all kinds of attitudes in our life have attachments, have objects. 
as I said earlier, if you're afraid, you're afraid of something. If you're angry, you're angry about something. If you believe, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, listen, I watch movies and stuff, and it's like people, on, they'll say, well, I think the great virtue is faith. And you know that they're too stupid to know what they're talking about because they're, uh, I, I have faith. Faith in what? There's no such thing as faith without in something that has an object. The same with all other aspects of the soul like love. You can't love without an object. So the object, listen, the object, the Bible says, so we think of fear as a sin normally, but the Bible says if you fear God, that's not sin. That's smart. That's being wise. Uh, if he says fear him who can kill the soul. So there's a righteous fear. The Hebrews 4 says fear that you're going to come short of the promise. So there's a righteous fear. There's a righteous anger. There's a righteous love, and there's an unrighteous love. You can love, agape love, the wrong things. The Bible says that the Pharisees, they loved, they agapeed, agapaoed, the chief seats in the synagogue. They wanted to be known, have these places of prompt. Their confidence, their love, was in having these chief seats, the praise that came from it, the way it made them feel, that was their happiness. They, put, they, they made that the object of their love. So here's the point. All of these different aspects of the soul, faith, hope, love, they have an object. And the object, the object of your, these different aspects of the soul determine whether it's a righteous or unrighteous faith, hope, love, fear. It's the object. Look at the object. You're going to say, how do I look at the object? I'm about to show you. How does it work? I told Steve at the break. We're talking about what it is. Now, how does it work? So, this you've got all these objects of hope, and this is what you do when you do a categorical study. You take the word hope. Now, I just did a New Testament category. I didn't go through the Old Testament. But you take all the, all the where places the Bible talks about hope every one of them, and you see what it's, what hope's attached to. John 5, 45, their hope was in the Mosaic law. We've seen these in, in uh, Romans 5, 2, their hope is in the glory of God. What does it mean to have hope in the glory of God? It means that when, when everything it comes to completion, when the universe comes to completion, that God's glory, God's righteousness, and God's rightness uh, to do everything that he's going to do is going to be revealed. His greatness is going to be revealed. And we're going to be there, and we're going to be part of it. We're going to share in it because we're in Christ, and his glory is now our glory. And so the hope of the glory of God is the confidence that when all that happens, I'm going to be there with him in a place of, of reverence, in a place of honor, loved and beloved and included, not excluded. You can go on and read all these. Hope in God, hope in the calling, rich is the power. All right. Now, hope begins with the gospel of grace, Colossians 1, 5 and 1, 23. We know this because the hope that he says, the hope that is laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. So everything starts with the gospel. And the hope that we have in the gospel is of, is of eternal life. God will save you. Believe in the death, burial, and resurrection that Christ did it for you and you will be saved. You have eternal life. That's the confidence we have. That's what we can expect. That's the word hope. So, our confidence is that we will receive all that is promised in the gospel message. That's where we begin. Now, here's how hope works. 
this, go back to this Ephesians 1. If you'll turn to that, back to that Ephesians 1 passage, Ephesians 1, 18, actually start with verse 17. I want to show you how hope works. How do you use it in your life? I mean, how is hope a practical, helpful thing in your life? First of all, you're using hope whether you realize it or not. You're doing it already. Your confidence is in certain things, whatever they might be. A lot of people have put their confidence in politics and the political landscape and the way things are going. And there's no doubt that our nation and its, and its status up or down is determined by some things going on in our nation. We're at a really critical place. And, and listen, we've been, we've been moving to the liberal side since the Civil War. Before the Civil War, states were the dominant players. I mean, your state was more bigger and badder than the federal government. And then Lincoln usurped power by defeating the states and then gobbled them up, and now the federal government, now so we're moving liberal. Uh, but look, that's not... Moving liberal is not always wrong. The founders of the Constitution were considered classical liberals. A class, See, up until the 1700s, people believed that the, that the conservative way of thinking about life was that all rights and power were invested in a king, in royalty. The classical liberals came along and said, no, natural rights, all rights are, exist within the individual. Every individual carries their rights with them. King doesn't have any more rights than you do. That was a classical, see, you're moving away from what's been considered the traditional view, and that's the definition of liberal. Sometimes that's good. But point being, we're moving pretty hard toward that. And it's ultimately, if the Bible's true, we're ultimately going to move that way. That's the devil's program is, to, is globalism, to bring everything under one head so that he can try to control it. And that's when the rapture will come and all those things. But thirdly, let's go to this Ephesians 1 and let's see how hope works. He says... I want you, with the eyes of your heart, your ability to form images in your mind. Did you know you can form images in your mind? Did you know that you do that all the time? You do it every day, all day long. Form images. This is part of how we think. It's very simple. It's important to understand it, and Paul tells us this in this way to help us to understand the mechanics of thinking and the mechanics of hope. So he says in verse 17, I pray the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation through knowledge of him. This spirit is literally message, a message, an insight, an understanding of wisdom and, and, and understanding of revelation through knowledge. So the eyes of your heart are going to be used to visualize knowledge. You're going to be given wisdom and insight so that you can see. You follow? You can see it. Most of the verb, most of the Greek verbs for thinking are are used in the literal sense, are verbs of seeing. It's to see with your mind. You see it. Do you see that? See what I'm saying? Do you see it? You go, yeah, I can see that. That's the eyes of your heart. So 
He said, and I pray that the eyes of your heart, which is your ability to form images, having been enlightened or given light. You see, the Holy Spirit takes these ideas, these concepts he's about to mention, he's about to list, and gives you light so that your soul, your heart can see that. that he give you light, he shines light so that you may know, and the word know is oida, which literally means to see with your eyes or your mind or to know completely. I pray that God will give you a message, an understanding of that results in wisdom and insight through full knowledge, that the eyes of your heart, your ability to visualize or form images, having been given light, so that you may see with your mind, and then he's going to list some things. First, the hope of his calling. The hope of your calling. Now, when he says the hope of your calling, what he's saying is all the things that are included in the call of God for your salvation. Your calling includes everything. The fact that you're the gospel was brought to you, that you were willing to hear it, you were ready to hear it, you believed it, now you're saved, the Spirit indwells you, you've got the Word of God, you live out the Christian life, we call it phase two. When you die, you go to be with the Lord. When the Lord, when all this comes to the end and everybody's resurrected, you're going to be there in a resurrection body, you're going to rule with Christ, you're going to be with Him forever. That's the hope or confidence of your calling. That's a big picture, isn't it? That's more, that's like a movie. You know you can create a movie in your mind? Yep, now. You can, cre you can use the visual aspect of your heart to see a movie like that. Or you can use the visual part of your heart to see other movies. Lust in your heart. That's a movie, isn't it? Maybe... Maybe your hope or your confidence is in your, in your money or in your looks. And some of us have it, you know. Uh, you know, you just, if you really have it, you don't have to overcompensate like that. But, you know. Uh, anyway, he wants us to be able to see and form images in our mind with the light that the Holy Spirit shines the hope of our calling, everything related to our spiritual life, from salvation to the resurrection, the riches of his glorious inheritance. Here we are. We're going to share the riches of God, the riches of Jesus. Jesus owns everything, and we're going to share that. He wants you to see that with your mind. And the third thing, the exceeding greatness of his power that's in us, that works for us, he wants you to see that as well. Everything related to your salvation and your calling, the reward of sharing everything that Christ owns, we now own too, and the power that's in us to overcome any problem, any, any opposition. He wants you to see that with your mind. Okay? That's how hope works. Hope is you seeing those things and attaching your confidence to it. Telling yourself, I believe that. That's what's going to happen to me. I don't know what's going to happen to you, dude, but this is what's going to happen to me. Here's my future. Now, when you're depressed, when you're discouraged, and you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, and life's not going well for you, and you can't figure out why, and you take the... You, you, grab a hold of your soul and you create this image of your, this hope of your calling, the riches of his glory, his glorious inheritance, the power that's in us, and you see that with your mind and you grab a hold of it with your confidence, it'll pull you out of depression. It'll pull you up. It'll help you rise. It'll help you defeat the negativity in your life. But you got to do it. You got to choose to do that. You got to choose to use your ability to see with your mind, which you listen, we use it all day long, but
but most of what we visualize is worldly stuff. It may not be sinful. It may not be wrong. It's just worldly. It's just focused on the worldly things instead of what's real. So, you close your eyes. All right, if you will, close your eyes for just a minute. I'm, I, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to close my eyes, and I'm, I'm going to create an image of being righteous with him. I'm standing with him. I'm, in, I'm actually connected to him. He's righteous, and so am I. That means that everything that comes along is used to bless me and never curse me. I can see that in my mind. I see that. Wow. I mean, I got it made. Nothing can hurt me. Nothing can harm me. Wow. Okay. That's how you do it. That's the way it works. I mean, you can visualize yourself righteous with God in heaven, indwelt by the Spirit in a resurrection body, sharing in the glory of Christ, uh, connected to your loved ones. The war's been won. All evil is locked up, and the righteous ones are ruling with him, and you can see that in your mind, and you can rejoice in that. You can put your, you can attach your hope, your confidence, your certainty to that image. You invoke this image when you wake up in the morning, when you're discouraged, when you're lonely, when you need to be reminded that God loves you. You invoke this image. In Colossians 1.21, he says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. means to visualize being in Christ when the victory is full, when the victory is won, you're in Christ. Wow. You're on the winning team. Titus 2.13 says he talks about looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. You're looking. Now, how are you looking? Are you looking in the sky? Waiting on him to it? No. You're looking in your soul. You're looking in your soul. Now, now, now listen. What is the big problem in your life today? Because you got one. Everybody's got them. What's the, what's the great challenge? What are you struggling with? I mean, you got marital trouble. You think, oh, man, you got, you got health problems, finances. What are you struggling with? Listen, visualize Christ stomping on it. Now, you don't you want to visualize him stomping on your husband, or you could. You could. No, honey, no. Uh, don't let that become your prayer. Uh, but see Christ resolving it for you. See it. That's how you practice. That's how you attach hope. You make an image of what you believe, what the Bible says is true about your future, and you attach your certainty to it. Okay. Fourthly, our hope, our confidence, our certainty is attached to the next life. And it's based on the resurrection of Christ, of Jesus. In Psalm 16, verse 8 and 9, he says, The Lord said, this is Jesus prophetically through, through David, I have set the Lord continually before me. Now look, how do you do that? How do you set the Lord continually before you? You do it by seeing him in your mind. You see him in your mind and you set him before you. I set the Lord continually before me. He is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh shall rest in confidence. Jesus, as he approached the moment where he knew, what, he knew where he was headed, he knew he was going to the cross. He knew what was going to happen. He was able to do that because in his mind he could see that God would not leave him to decay. He would, he would only be in the grave long enough to fulfill his mission and be resurrected. He knew that. He saw it in his mind. 
He, he put his certainty in it. He believed it. See, believing and hope, they're really the same thing. They're just two sides of it. Hope is really the result of faith. Death was a one-way door from Adam until the moment of his resurrection. And then he defeated death, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, 55. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? And listen, as always, God took our greatest problem and turned it into an incredible blessing. Death now is a door. Death is a door. Death is a door to the greatest blessing. Listen, death is a door to the carnival. You know, you're dying and everybody's weeping, you're sad and everything, and you die and you open the door and it's like a party's going on. You're like, y'all can have that. I'm going here. All right, fifthly, hope or confidence for daily living attaches your confidence, your certainty to an image of God's grace and promises. 1 Peter 1.13, therefore, I love the way he says that, gird up the loins of your mind. Your heart has eyes and your mind has loins. You, you know, you just, I don't know. And literally in the Greek, that's what it says. That's not a euphemism. It's gird up the loins of your mind. This is Peter, of course. Stay sober in spirit. Attach your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You're to attach your confidence, your certainty, totally on grace that's, to, that's already been given to you and that will be given to you. Listen, it's grace all the way. Here's how grace works. You still in Ephesians? Let me show you real quick. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul's going to go from verse 3 to verse 14 is one sentence. It's the longest sentence in the New Testament or in, in the Bible period, maybe in English writing. Maybe it's close, but it's a very, very long sentence, meaning it's one thought. It's one long theological thought where he puts everything together in this one sentence. And the first thing that he gives us in this one long discussion, theological discussion about salvation, God's purpose, where this is headed, he starts with your blessing. Now here's what this means. Before God even created the universe, he created your blessings. And he stretched them out and laid them out in front of you so that every moment of your life, every step that you take, your blessings from your needs to your rewards are already stretched out in front of you. They're already laid out so that every step you take, boom, they drop on you. See, that's grace. Grace says, so we think, oh, I'm going to pray and God's going to respond. No, you're going to pray and God already responded in eternity past and has already laid out your blessing. It's already there. Now, here you are fretting and worried and, <gasps> oh, no. And yet it's already laid out. It's already there waiting to drop on you, waiting to drop. So, what are we talking about here? Oh, yeah, looking for grace, fixing your hope, your confidence, your certainty on grace. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Now may the Lord, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and a good hope by grace. How's our, how's our good hope coming? By grace. Comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Hebrews 4.16 is a good one to read on that. And finally, attaching confidence to images of God's promise. God's promise is, is a choice we must make daily. Again, 1 Peter 1.13, gird up the loins of your mind for action. Keep sober in spirit. Attach your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
keep your mind aware and alert. Attach your confidence fully and totally on God's grace for living today and for living tomorrow. Make an image of what God has promised. See it in your mind and take your hope, your certainty, and attach to it. And listen, grab it and embrace it. Grab it and embrace it and don't let it go. You can visualize it squealing and trying to get away. Don't let it go. It's yours. God gave it to you. He did. Let's pray. Father, what a great privilege. Thank you for so many things. Thank you for all the promises. Thank you for honoring them, for, for so obviously honoring them. Thank you for those who, who are with us today. I pray for those who are at Shaco, and I pray for what's coming for this church, Father. We love you. We praise you. In Christ's name, amen.